as we get older, we start to understand that time is far more precious than it used to be. Um, it's proven that uh, 70% of entrepreneurs had a significant emotional experience before the age of 16. 10% of the UK population are dyslexic. But what I find really interesting with entrepreneurs which are making over a million, 35% of those are dyslexic. The schooling system hasn't. And, the, the, you know, don't get me onto my conspiracy bits about that. Well, no, let, I want to get onto it. Okay, let, let's get on. onto it. And action. <laughs> Claire, I'm so glad you've come down today. I met you about a year ago. Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just over a year. And you've gone from a really good mentor to a really close friend. Thanks, Rick. And Thank you, <laughs> it's all right. And I just, uh, I just want people to know a little bit about you, really. So okay. from the top, tell me your story. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me down. And uh, yeah, it's been about 12 months since we last met. Uh, sorry, since we first mm. met. And uh, thanks. And, you know, it's, mm. uh, it's, it's an honour to be here today. So I just wanted to get that in before we start. So, yeah, I'm Claire Bell. Um, I'm 47, just, and uh, single mum, entrepreneur. Um, I'm known as the bear entrepreneur. Um, I say not as a bear as an animal. Um, uh, bear as in laid bear. And that's because of my uh, distinct honesty. And um, that's probably innate, something I was gifted and born with. And um, I, I started my life in a, uh, in a relative, relatively deprived area of the UK, a place called Stoke-on-Trent. And um, I was born into a, uh, a, a family, my mum and dad, and uh, I got an older sister. And I've had a, I wouldn't say a life of hardships per se. Um, I'm very grateful for all the experiences that I've had, but it's, uh, it's, it's been an interesting route. It's been an interesting route from, from birth to today. And, mm. uh, through that, through that time, um, my, my home life, um, has, has been interesting, shall we say. Sometimes it would be tumultuous. Uh, my parents never saw, uh, eye to eye on a, on a rate or they didn't see eye to eye on a regular basis. And, um, you kind of get parceled within that. Mm. And um, that led me to um, discovering myself quite soon on as, as a youngster and um, working out the dynamics of, a, of an interesting family, family setup. Um, I, was I was born into a community that I'd say probably wasn't my community. Now, that's okay. not to decry my parents or their parenting. That's to say that um, from a very young age, I was quite independent and um, I, I needed to find my feet probably from, I, I've got recollection going back to about the age of two. So if we fast forward through that, my, I suppose my first entrepreneurial experiences were maybe from the age of about six or seven. I started to work out that I was got quite an aptitude for, for making money. Okay. Uh, and I, I did that through a series of different things, hustling family. Um, I won't tell you who. Love you all. Yeah, uh, just in case. Hust hustling family members um, by singing at parties, and um, th and that was probably earlier than the age of two, uh, than the age of six, and then uh, capitalising on things like Guy Fawkes Night, uh, um, Halloween, Christmas carols. Um, I once went to a Christmas party mm. when I was about the age of eight or ten, and uh, there'd been a load of party poppers lo let off. And I saw this collection of uh, what most people would be thinking is rubbish in the corner. So I put that all into a carrier bag, took it home, parceled it up into, into sandwich bags, went out carol singing. And whilst I got them at the door, I sold them what I call was Christmas tree decorations. No way. 10 pence a bag. <laughs> That's, then that's really where my entrepreneurial journey started. Right. Um, I, uh, I my, my dad, my dad had his own business, um, and uh, where most kids, you know, and I'm a gay woman, so uh, I had a I had a quite combined Christmas list. Mm. Um, I wanted a doll and a pram and a cowboy suit, um, and so I'd go up and down the street dressed dressed like this. But um, at the mm. same time, where most kids wanted toys that were, you know toys that got them going 
um, I wanted a, a till and I had this fascination that I always wanted a stamp. I used to get in post offices right. and, and so I could uh, so I could count money. And at the time, obviously, you don't know what this is. And I just had this fascination with wanting a till and a stamp and, a, and one of them things you used to have on the end of your finger to, to count cash. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, fast fast forward to, fast forward a few more years. Uh, at the age of 18, I uh, left home and left the country. I went out and uh, travelled to Greece, and um, there's a reason for that. I got kicked out of college. I didn't really know which direction I wanted to go in, but from a very young age, uh, 13, 14, I knew I wanted to travel. Mm. Um, but I wanted to travel and get somebody else to pay for it. And I was really fortunate. I um, got around the right people. I, was, um, I went for an interview. I then started to work in travel for several years. And I, I was very fortunate that they did pay for it. And so I've because traveled. you had to learn from the experiences, is it? Uh, so they yeah. Well, they I was I was it. working for a travel a tour operator. So mm-hmm. um, one of the great things about that job is it's so diverse. Um, you are taught to grow up very very quickly. Um, you are immersed in experiences that you know young people would would not get the opportunities to to have as a youngster. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're dealing with uh, quite traumatic situations, you know, n- notwithstanding the people enjoying their time on holiday. Um, but it doesn't matter whether you're at home or you're overseas, incidences mm-hmm. do happen and they can be positive and negative. And people get in trouble and you have to help them out. Well, when you're, mm-hmm. you know, 18, 19 and you're seeing death, destruction, rape and all those nasty, horrible, negative things, wow. it, it does teach you to grow up quite quickly. The other great thing about that experience of working for a tour operator for several years, um, I was really fortunate that I was put into resorts where um, I was self-managed, which is quite a dangerous prospect, really, for an entrepreneur. So I had some good opportunities to make some really, really substantial wins whilst I was not being managed by anyone from head office. I hope no one's watching this that used to be my manager. <laughs> and um, and so I used to come home with quite a lucrative pot of cash at the end of the season. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> um, that's, again, notwithstanding, they, they mm. still had all of my results um, and, and, and all of my, uh, all of my, all of my uh, financial uh, monthly targets were always achieved. Mm. So I uh, did that for several years, came back to the UK um, finally in 1998 and I moved to London and I came, came back from Portugal and, and moved to London and from 98 to 99 I was working for an independent recruitment organisation in Regent Street in London and that's where I cut my teeth really on my first job back in the UK. So I was, uh, I was 20, 25, 26 then so before I, I, I had a, what we would call a proper job. And um, very quickly realised that um, I I was really fascinated by the way that people ticked, mm. and so um, how they how they tick, what goes on in their mind. I was working with people. I was essentially selling people uh, in recruitment. So I worked in uh, office sport recruitment, and um, I got to know and understand humans very quickly. And that's really where the philosophy interest and psychology interest came in. In 1999, I started my own organisation and um, I, I, I coined a phrase, crabs in the bucket. Everybody was saying to me, okay. oh, you, you, you can't start a recruitment business in London. You know, there's 10,000 recruiters in the square mile. And I just thought, well, if there's 10,000, one more is, is a fish in a pot, basically. And um, what have I got to lose? Nothing. If 10,000 people are successful and there's 10,000 people working in this square mile, then there's enough business for 10,000 people. So 10,001 people is not going to make a massive difference. And I want a bite of that apple. So the way you saw it was, the reason is there's loads of people successful in that area anyway. There's got to be a reason for that, isn't there? Absolutely. So, so that you you actually saw people's responses. You saw a different side of it, didn't you? You actually think, well, I don't, there's right, a bit of a clue yeah. there. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. And also, if there's if there's 10,000 people, there's mm. 10,000, you know, enough for 10,000 people doing business. So how can this one person do it different than them? If they're following one route, what can I do that's different? Mm. And what did you do differently? Was there I haven't anything? a clue. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't a clue. Um, it's that personal choice. And I believe mm. that with anything in life, people buy from people. Um, you know, I, agree, I, I could be working for anyone. It just so happens I was working for myself. Um, I had a, an absolutely fantastic boss and mentor um, for, the, for the year and a half. 
who I'm still in contact with now, um, and by all rights and intents and purposes, he shouldn't be talking to me because I, I did walk off with quite a lot of business. Um, and that's the, the point I'm mentioning that is not, is, not to, um, is not to highlight that that's a good thing. It's to highlight that people buy from people. Mm. And, uh, and basically what I was doing, I just did it exceptionally better. Um, because the, the difference being, of course, is that when I was working for somebody, I was creating and, uh, and, and making somebody else's dream come true. Now was the time to make my own dream come true. And how could, how could, how could I take those learnings and, and do it slightly better, bigger, better, faster, stronger? Uh, mm. And that's what I focused on. And those people followed you, basically, and that's that's why you. That, like you that's said, exactly buy. it. That's yeah. exactly it. Um, I didn't. I didn't um, positively and purposefully go after um, that business. It just so happened that they followed me, mm. um, and that's where that's where my first business was was created, um, and that was massively successful. Um, I've since gone on to um, have uh, businesses and uh, work in emerging markets. Uh, a, around um, the energy performance sector, so housing sector. Mm. Um, I've, worked, I've, I've had businesses in the leisure and tourism industry, in hospitality and leisure, um, restaurants, and uh, most recently, uh, um, I'm, I'm now involved in property investments. Mm. So, so it'd be fair to say you don't like spare time as much, and you like to keep busy. <laughs> hey, listen, I've got the same 24 hours as anybody else has exactly, got. Yeah. I just, I, I, you know, I've, I've gone through life. Um, I, I've learned how to manage those 24 hours purely through mistakes. And that is, is that how much I've wasted a lot of time, a lot mm. of time. I'm the first one to hold up my hands and say I have procrastinated a ton. Mm. Um, but what I've done, I've certainly fine tuned that. And that when people come to me and say I haven't got time, it's, it's, that's, the, that's the biggest fallacy that there is. See, everyone's got time it, it makes my blood boil when people say that now and and i probably one of the most laziest people i know especially in my early 20s um i, I wanted to get the work done as fast as possible in a way mm -hmm. um but what that did teach me in a way that there are there are ways of making certain works and processes faster and that you, you can streamline things and i wouldn't say i'm lazy as much now but i definitely do find a faster way to do something, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And, and get the same results yeah, and same level of quality, but there is always a faster, more efficient way. Mm. You're right, Ricky. And do you know what? I think a lot of that has to come with age as well. When we're 20, we've got, you know, when we're younger and we were in our 20s, we've got all this life ahead of us. We've got, mm. we've got tons of time. So things are not, things are not as important to get it done as quick when you're in your 20s because we, we don't have the full concept and range of, of, of how precious time actually is. Mm. When we start going around the clock a few times and we understand that you know, life isn't as easy as we think it is yeah. um, and we, we develop those experiences and those skills and that wisdom, we then start to realise, hey, the clock is ticking and it's fast and once that minute's gone, it's gone. We ain't getting it back. Definitely. And we start to have a different appreciation for that. We start to respect time more and we start to give it more attention. And so we should. Um, mm. We also become more present as well. Uh, things like having children, of course, affect that too. It does, yeah. And yeah. Uh, which we can both relate to. We can now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so so we, I think as we get older, we start to understand that time is far more precious than it used to be. Far, mm. far more precious. And that really affects the way that we procrastinate and how, how much we take, and much more we take action. Well, so I, I do wonder sort of what, what is that switch which triggers in people's minds? So when they go from, you know, procrastinating quite a lot to suddenly just full on going for it yeah and and where I, I do wonder even for myself and for other people is it certain experiences of people passing away in your life and births you know so I've got seven month old now yeah um do they are those certain things which make you shift your gear into a faster speed each time and I do wonder uh, yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, most most of what we react to, so so mm -hmm. we're we're either moving towards something or away something fr from something um, at all times, um, unless we're rigidly stuck in our comfort zone. And generally, it is a significant emotional experience that leads us to reassess really where we are in life, what we're doing, and how quick we're going to do it, mm -hmm. and how fast we take action to get it done. Yeah. And so so most def definitely. Um, Coming back to what you were talking about, about me, my life and some hardships, um, mm. it's proven that 70% uh, of entrepreneurs had a significant emotional experience before the age of 16. Um, and that 
how did that how did that mm. translate into them becoming an entrepreneur because if they've had that emotional experience and depending what support mechanisms are around them they have had to survive they've mm. had to find a way to survive so i think that's i think that's a significant statistic that is 70% huge. Uh, mm. and it's it's you know that's really made me open my eyes around understanding more about entrepreneurs mm. Well, I've got another one for you then for, for entrepreneurs. And yeah. So, so yeah, as you know, I'm dyslexic. Yep. Uh, my spelling and reading skills are completely atrocious. Um, so 10% of the UK population are dyslexic. But what I find really interesting with entrepreneurs, which are making over a million, 35% of those are dyslexic. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a crazy jump when you're looking at the UK population. But yeah, so I love facts and absolutely massive yep. millions of facts. That's that's a really mm. good one actually and I want to I want to step into education and schooling around mm. that and I think that you know we um, we we've had some of these conversations before about how I feel about the schooling system and and, yeah. and how negative it is for children. And don't get me wrong, there are some real positives around the schooling system with um, children and social interaction and growth and development. Mm. But I think the actual education and academic side of it is completely defunct. It's stayed um, the same for so many years, hasn't it? It's, it's based on a Victorian model. Um, yeah. If you take the mobile phone, for example, and we look at that, how it's advanced in the last 20 years, mm. the education model is exactly the same as it was when it was first introduced 200 years ago. It has <laughs> not evolved. Mm. Um, how, the, how, the, how, the, how the car has evolved, how the human has evolved, but the schooling system hasn't. And, the, the, you know, don't get me onto my conspiracy bits about that. Well, no, let, I want to get onto it. Okay, let, let's on. get onto it. So, oh, I was hoping so, you'd say that. So let's, let's see if I can touch on it as well. So, so a belief system I have is that it's set up to get you basically into a job of working for someone else and, and this sort of um, in the, into the manufacturing world in a way. That's, that's correct. Um, that's do correct. you agree? Uh, absolutely, Ricky. <laughs> so so the, the basis of the education system was born out of the, the rise of the industrial yes. revolution um, and the industrial uh, industry growth. And suddenly the, the industry um, found that they didn't have enough workers with the aptitude to come in and, and, and work in this emerging market. Mm. And it was growing at a rate of knots. And so um, what happened was is that you know, the, the industry collaborated with government and suddenly we had this education system that was churning people out that um, were, uh, were, were taught the basic skills of uh, accounting, mm. communication, and reading in order to uh, satisfy what the industry needed. Mm. And they were created almost uh, with, with a mindset of putting people on a conveyor belt. Yes. And, yeah. um, and, and, you know, so the reason that that was is that if you look at the factories, people were stood in lines. Mm. So what was created was an education system based on where they were moving into. Um, this was a win-win, of course. So as this all emerged, they more needed more people in education to understand how the industry was working, uh, the industrial, of course, uh, the industrial revolution in its mm. entirety. And then, and then suddenly, the government was getting another hit from this because it got, you've got income tax, yeah. and also you've got uh, you've got um, uh, business tax. So government was great, right? How can we get more people in? And so that model has never evolved. No. It's never evolved. Mm. And so we're producing, we're now, of course, we have a, a public sector because we needed to make sure these people were okay, that were coming through these these, these education lines into work because then if they weren't working, they weren't well. Uh, sorry, if they weren't well, they weren't working. If mm. they weren't working, they weren't earning. If they weren't earning, well, they weren't paying into the taxation system, et cetera, et cetera. So then we provide a, uh, a national health service and on with that. Then, yes, you can use it, but then you've got to pay for it. And so we go yeah. round and around and around. And what I find interesting as well is, okay, those children had studied in that sort of area. Now they're parents. And yeah. as parents, they're encouraging their children, some of them, to do exactly the same thing. And then that creates that ongoing cycle then over and over again. Yeah. So so we have what I call as a tribal cycle. And a tribal cycle is, is five generations. And tribal cycles are based on belief systems, paradigms, okay. um, and, and things like schooling. Now, I was really lucky uh, my father, although um, he went to school, mm. and he uh, <laughs> got his drink. Reach over so, to get my drink. Yeah, it so he, he went to school. He went through the schooling system, but mm. he um, he wasn't he wasn't massively he wasn't a massive advocate of the schooling system. So, although I was encouraged to go to school, there wasn't that encouragement to go beyond school. And the, the biggest favor, one of the biggest favors, my father did to me was he said to me, "If you want to go to university, you fund it yourself, and that's it. I ain't interested." 
Right, okay. Um, and so, so basically, when, you know, w- when, when we look at um, or my background and the, the encouragement that I had, I had through the schooling system, um, my cycle was broken. And I, and I was lucky because that made me think and mm. any bits of information that I had as a child, I always kind of, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a strategic mind. I want to know if you give me a piece of information, I want to see the whole 360 degree of that information. And I'm not afraid to ask the questions around that. Mm. So I, I, I was lucky that my tribal cycle was completely broken. But most of the population, um, you know, they... they 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 they're based on the beliefs or they're basing on the belief system that you know you must go to school because you've got to go to school because if you don't do well at school you're not going to get a good job if you don't get a good job you won't get good pay mm. so this is this is information that's been fed to children from the ages of 5 well you know the brain um, you know if we if we're giving the brain a habit if we are reinforcing that information to the brain from the ages of 5 to now the ages of 18 when people finish school that's, that's a lot of reinforcement. It is, yeah. How do we unpick that reinforcement? Because the other thing that children are not taught is that, you know, we are we, we have an education model that teaches children that job equals money. Mm. Okay, well, there's a lot of other ways that you can get money. Um, and then this isn't from a, you know, I'm not talking from a, a greed perspective. I'm talking about from a survival perspective. Mm. Um, there's assets. There's your own business. Um, there's, there's many different things as, mm. as an alternative to actually going and doing exchanging time for money, which is what they don't teach in schools, isn't it? Exactly. And and I think that's the the level of finance that they don't teach in schools really is is what they should. You know, they're talking about investments and mm-hmm. and different passive ways to Absolutely. to make a living. And and I think that's one of the biggest weaknesses. And and then whenever anyone wants to then start a business, they don't have that level of education to to manage their own cash flow and finances mm-hmm. as well. And that's, I think, why businesses fail. So if you were able to put that level of education into the school system, whether they do want to start their own business or work for someone else, at least they have that skill set to make the right decision. Yeah. yeah. The, the challenge we've got there, Ricky, that you are, you know, you, you're talking about a, a, a cultural society. So with teachers... You know, they don't forget they they're also in a tribal cycle. Teachers, mm. you, you need you need worker ants to create more worker ants, and that's what teacher uh, teachers are. And I'm not decrying the job that teachers do. I think they're absolutely fantastic. You know, they, the amount of children that they take care of and they bring them through growth processes. You know, so this this isn't an onslaught onto teachers, but they are worker ants for mm. the system, and they are creating more worker ants, and that's how it goes around. So you can't suddenly say to a teacher, "Hey, today we're going to start teaching about finances and business," yeah. because you've got to you've got to unbreak their cycle and the five cycles probably that they've already gone through their tribal cycles of of of, of paradigms and belief systems, etc. Very true. But mm. and also, so if we go into an education system or if we go into a school and say, "Hey, we're going to come in and start teaching you about entrepreneurship, finances, alternative investments, uh, passive yeah. income," you know, you've then so if you're talking to a head teacher. You, you've got to you've got to unpick their belief system and you've got to sell it to them. Mm. So we, we're talking about whole cultural cultural uh, thought processes that you know it's you go in and say that's akin to saying right we're going to plant a sunflower seed but we expect a tomato plant. Mm. It's not going to work. <laughs> if we plant a sunflower seed, we're going to get a get sunflower. sunflower seed. Yeah. If we plant a tomato seed, we're going to get a tomato mm. plant. <laughs> but we can't cross pollinate the both um, and, unless we do some working and you know really mm. get invasive with the two seeds and I, th- I think the culture is slowly changing but you're probably looking at another 10 to 15 years where anything really happens where in the educational system isn't it really i think i think there's uh, you know there's, there's a lot of link that links there uh, certainly yeah. to uh mental illness mental challenges yeah. um, uh, um which are becoming more and more prevalent with younger and younger children um, and that's because society is changing and th- this is why it's absolutely so important because at the moment we've got society uh, advancement technical advancement mm. it you know it's moving so quickly but the education system isn't moving with it 
Mm. Um, and so we're creating these anxieties in children. We're creating these demands that, you know, children think differently now. There's a complete different belief system with children. Um, expectation is different. But we haven't moved the education system on with that. No. Um, but what is great, what we are seeing with the education system are things around mindfulness, yoga meditation, which, of course, you know, we're, de we're dealing with the mind at an, at an early age. We're creating these patterns and these thoughts that will hopefully help children um, as they're advancing through into adulthood. Mm, that's right. And and one thing I've seen actually in, in terms of nursery, so I'm currently looking for or have found a nursery for yep. my little one. Some of the nurseries we visited, they are actually um, going along the lines of being more creative and rather than giving them set things to do throughout the day, they let the children pick out which drawer of toys they want to play mm -hmm. with and they could be so different. You know, one could have very sort of nature-based toys in terms of acorns and different things in it and the other one could be quite um, constructual and have uh, like construction toys in there, I suppose. But the, giving them the choice and the freedom to play with what they want to play with before uh, and mm. in terms of um, drawer as well. I've never actually seen that in other nurseries and it's just the one nursery we visited quite a few yeah. and it's just the one nursery I saw that in yeah. and I thought that was quite a beautiful thing because that's the early stages yeah. of uh, creativity and uh, sort of um, letting them develop their mind in their own way yeah. and hopefully it does pass on through the other yeah. sort of years of the educational system really. That's it. And there, there are there are uh, education environments around um, from from key stage one right the way up to you know when when children are leaving school that that do encourage and foster that thought process, but mm. they're very few and far between. And if you think about you know just by giving the child the uh, autonomy to go and choose one of those drawers which they are uh, I suppose drawn to. From mm. he, from a whether it's a soul, a mind, or you know, the, the just just interest mm. into, that's allowing them to be to create independence and exactly. create individualism, and that's so important because statistics have shown that um, f through the schooling process, and this was a study done by NASA, that when you tested children at the age of five, some of those children had um, IQs, massive massive IQs. And also, uh, uh, the creativity was up at something like 89%. And by the time they got to the age of 11, uh, and then further on, uh, I think, sorry, it was 12, that had crushed down to about 10%. Right. And, and the reason for that is, is that because of the number of the uh, class sizes and also the education model, is that we have to, you know, we're not siloed, well, well I suppose to a little degree. Mm. Um, this is what we're learning today. And there is no, there's no facility for children that are not academic. It's still based on an academic model because that's mm. what it produces. It wants academic of a certain standard um, to produce outcomes. It's that, the early for, signs of the conveyor belt, isn't it? Exactly, to produce mm. outcomes who are suitable for the likes of the public sector. Mm. Now, if you've got children that are creative, uh, musical, sp uh, all, all those sporty is all, also encouraged. Uh, and again, not massively. I've seen some start startling outcomes um, in some schools. If you've got head teachers that mm. are not sporty, um, it's fed down from the top. Um, similarly, if yeah. you've got head teachers that are sporty, then that's fed down from the from the top. Mm. <clears throat> so if you if if you again look at children that they've come through, they've, they've hit nursery, they've been given this ability to, uh, you know, exploit their own autonomy and create their own identity. And then when, when they're going through the education system, it's like, you've got to put your hand up for this. And, you know, even in my son's school, they have this, you know, I know the answer to this. And, and yeah, you don't want absolute chaos in a classroom. But mm. I think if you've got that right communication with, you can, you know, you can have communication with 30 children as long as everybody knows how to communicate with each other, but to actually ask them to be silent and, and you know, they're still doing this, you mm. know, I, I, I don't dig that. I think I encouraging the children to listen to each other mm. will lower the chaos anyway, isn't it, in a way? Absolutely. And that's probably the answer is just encourage them to listen to each other. I, encourage them to listen to each other and encourage the individualism, you know, yeah. okay, there are some lively children out there yeah. and that, you know, they have different needs than the children that are not so lively. Um, and, and there is a way to, to, I suppose, to contain chaos. You know, I'm not a teacher, so I don't know what they go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm sure there's teachers that may be watching this that are pointing their fingers at me going, you haven't got a clue. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. But I try to understand from a strategic and a logistical, uh, you know, understanding 
mm. of what they are going through. And I suppose I should add here that I do work with a lot of children and I work in a lot of schools. I, I coach yeah. children as young as seven um, around self-belief and self, uh, self-confidence and empowerment so you know i'm not just i'm not just whistling whistling from a <laughs> hole with no you know no background and substance from that mm. I, I didn't actually realize you did that actually yeah, so, yeah. so I, I know you did the performance coach for yeah for sort of teenagers and the adults yeah i didn't know you went as young as seven actually yeah, yeah that's, so, that's brilliant so my j- journey with that um <clears throat> with uh, working with young people started uh, mm. almost 10 years ago now where i uh for, for all intents and purposes, I committed career suicide. Um, gave, gave up, gave up my six-figure um, strategic management consultant job in the city. Um, decided that I wasn't fulfilled. It wasn't my purpose. It wasn't my mission. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I started working with young, deprived uh, teenagers um, from the age of fourteen to the age of twenty-five. And we were we were trying to transform their lives positively. I was working with a team of Olympians. Uh, with the Dame Kelly Homes Trust, and we positively affected the lives of well over 300 people, um, some of which I'm still in contact with now, and wow. um, I still I still like to know what they're doing and how well they're doing, and and not only that, you know, we sometimes the wheels fall off, and that they know that you know that they can still send a message, and I'm there to help, mm. and that then uh, I suppose escalated to looking at how younger children. Um, the, the the psychology of younger children and and how life is evolving, how fast life is evolving, and what impacts these these evolvements we're having, uh, you know, with home life and school life and their individual life as well, and what's now happening with mental health, mental challenges, um, self belief, confidence, and so yeah, so I've I've been working with a, a range of schools nationally for the last five years now. That's great. Mm. Yeah. Well. Another area I wanted to talk about then is sort of university students and that age range. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw a fact over to you and then we'll discuss on that. Yeah. <laughs> so it was one I heard about two weeks ago and it amazed me. Uh, but 56% of university students yep. are studying for a job role which will no longer exist in between eight to 10 years. Yep. Okay. And no surprise. Yeah. But it was definitely one where it's like, well, you know, what what's next? What what? If they're studying for that now, whatever job role it's going to be, that's quite a scary thought, mm. knowing that, okay, they finish their studies, even if they did have that sort of job role, they yeah. may be made redundant very quickly. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. And that, that figure doesn't surprise me, Ricky. Um, and I'd say probably, for, you know, if, if you're going to do something that you need a university degree for, um, you know, certainly uh, if you're going into the medicine industry or uh, the medical industry, um, you know, aeronautical industry, those mm. those kind of scientific roles, I think that that kind of education is is key. Mm. Um, life has evolved very quickly over the last thirty years, extremely fast. Yeah. And um, but again, you know, w- w- when we say the education system, that that's not excluding the university either. Um, although there's been massive advancements in university and, and that system, um, it's still not caught up with the quick the environment and you know everything else is is, is evolved and so you, you've also got there this tribal cycle that i referred to so if you've got their parents so these these youngsters uh, mm-hmm. young people that are at university studying for jobs that don't exist you know if their parents and their parents and their parents all went to university you know, I, I hear families all the time saying, oh, yeah, they go to university or oh, I'm devastated to not going to university. You know, let's not forget we we as human beings are, are born into a culture. We're born into a, a community. We're born into a tribe mm. between the ages of zero and 19. We're going through significant evolving. OK, and each each when we go right the way through birth, you know, even every six months, every six months has a different evolving pattern. And right the way up to 19, where we're working on our own identity. Now, when you get to 19, all of those belief systems that you've got, bar a few, um, depending on how independently minded you are, are your parents' belief systems, are your teachers' belief systems, are your peers' belief systems. We have a chance at 19 to recycle that, mm. where we can think, okay, do I, is this my place on the planet? Is this my purpose right now? And we can we can unpick those layers of the last 19 years, not all of them, but some of them, you know, may be more pertinent than others. 
and we can look at what what is actually my belief system. Mm. You know, I grew up in, in a very loud, shouty environment, and I, I always knew that I, what, I didn't fit there. Now, I'm a good shouter, you know, I can, I can fight, I can shout, I can scream, but it doesn't come naturally to me. I had to work at that because that was a belief system in, a, in an environment I was born into. By nature, in my soul, I'm a really peaceful person. I love peace. I like being quiet. I like being away from any chaos. And actually, I don't really like confrontation. But because I've developed that in that environment, I've actually got an aptitude for it that's been developed. That's interesting. So, yeah. so when we look at these young people in university, most of them are going through a belief system, which is tribal. Mm. Now... If we, you know, and, and, and why are you there? Are you there, you know, because you want to really be there? Are you there because your friends are there? Are you there because your parents want you there? Question why you're there, okay? Then we've got, of course, the education system where, you know, they're not going to suddenly turn around and go, hey, yeah, thanks, thanks, we, we've picked up you that you, you, you know, you know that in a few years' time you're not going to get a job out of this, but, um, you yeah, know, we don't want your money. You, you keep that. They're running a business, they're not going to turn around and say, no, we don't want you. Mm. Um, whichever way you look at this, and this is crude, but this is business. You know, without the money of students, they can't run those organizations. That's it, yeah. Mm. So, so it's, it's something that individuals have to take responsibility for and work out, is this pathway for me? Because the university isn't going to go, hey, you know, we feel sorry for you, take your money back. No, it's not going to happen. Not. So really, in a way, the earlier they can do that, the better for them, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a great there's a great saying that I use is that you know, we can't we can't protect our children from the future, we but we can prepare our children for the future. And I, I find the interesting thing though is that probably sometimes the the children know better about what the future is going to look like more than the adult because technology does move so fast. Yeah, uh, you've got so many children now saying they want to be YouTubers. And, and adults brushing that off like it's an unbelievable thing but really it's not um if you if you look at the way businesses are performing at the moment and the the um, attitudes they have they're paying influencers yeah. to promote something for them there there will be a point where those businesses it won't be you know it's not going to be affordable to keep paying these influencers all the time yeah. so they'll bring in their in-house influencers yeah 10 years that is pay them a normal salary then it saves money 10 years down the line, all these businesses are going to be doing that. Yeah. So for a child to say they want to be an influencer isn't actually an unrealistic thing at all. No, absolutely not. And I think we need to, we need to listen to children. You know, we need to guide children, but we need to listen to children because, you know, we, children are superbly gifted. They're gifted. And the, the, the beauty of children is, is they've not yet been bounced around the negativities of society. So mm. they're basing their experiences, certainly from the age of uh, zero to seven, a child is in the, in, in theta, which is essentially hypnosis. And so they are, they're absorbing everything that's going on because they've got no framework really to compare that to. Mm. They've got some, you know, emotional experiences that have, uh, that they've maybe affected um, through the, through the naught to seven years, but that's that's the format of which they are operating on. So they're operating in hypnosis. So these these are these are gifted children, you know, and we we should be listening to them. And I'm, I was smiling, Definitely. I was smiling like a Cheshire cat before because only last week I was out with my son who's almost seven. And he's like, hey, mum, you know, we were building dens in the wood. He's like, mum, mum, can, can we film this? Can you put this on YouTube for me? So now my son's got some content on YouTube and I want to encourage that. Yeah, um, and exactly. there's a few reasons for that. Obviously, I don't want to, I don't want to stunt his tech technology kind of impact. Interest as well. Absolutely yeah. no way. Because, you know, we hear all the time, you know, oh, let's not forget the age of communication. Let's not, you know, not too much time on a, on a device. And I, and I get all that. And it's really important. It's all about balance. Yeah. Um, but what I don't want to do is, you know, stunt his place in evolvement within technology. Um, and if he wants to, if he wants to sit and, and do something around um, developing, I don't know the first thing about developing, but I'll get him around the people that can help him to do that. Mm. And in contrast, you know, I also read a lot to him. I also make sure that he, wherever we are, and we spend a lot of time with adults, so he's, he's, he's fortunate that he's been around a real eclectic mix of people, mm. that he goes and speaks to all of those adults. So what, what we're doing is creating a, I always call it the, the, the cake, a perfect cake ingredients. Um, 
Mm. Because if we look at what a human needs, you know, there's, there's quite a few things in there. We're, we're complex as humans. And so I make sure that I'm trying to develop with him um, all of those skills that he needs in all of those different environments that he's likely to face as a human being when he's an adult. Mm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm full behind, you know, trying to give children that platform to, yeah. to use their voice. This is a lot of what we do in schools as well, because we, we also run a um, public speaking program as part of the RISE, uh, which, is, which is resilience, uh, independence, success and empowerment. Um, and the reason we do that is that um, social anxiety is, is massive amongst children. Um, and if you are, uh, if you're parenting in a way that you're giving, you know, a child, which I call it the electronic babysitter, um, an electronic device, because you're trying to do something. And I get that life's busy, you know, but if, if that's the case and suddenly we've got children, uh, a huge percentage of children that have an inability to communicate face to face, mm. when we put them in that environment, we're going to create a real anxiety, a fear, mm. because they've got nothing to base that on. So for me, in order to, uh, to, to make a varied program, um, it's really important that children can communicate. Massively important. Well, I've even seen this in my son already. So, so Carly, my wife, she spends all her time playing uh, with our seven-month-old. And when she goes and visits people, she pretty much just hands him over and he has that experience of interacting with different people. Yeah. But then when you we compare his development with other babies around, which are the same age or even older... Mm. He seems to be interacting so much more with other people, adults, the things around him, yep. laughing, smiling. And it's, it's just a strange thing to see, really. And I think you're all right. It's just having the more you can interact with them, yep. the more words you can speak to them and stuff like that as well. Yeah, it, is, it does make a difference, a massive difference. Absolutely. You think about how yeah. your, rich your life is by the amount of people that are in your life. You know, whether it's a lesson or a blessing, each one of those indiv individuals brings you something. Mm. Um, and, and how did you learn that about you know you how did you get that feedback uh, and that's through interacting uh, um, um, you know the same as we're doing now mm. so if we're interacting with five people we've only got that exchange of feedback with five people suddenly if we open our lives our minds our hearts uh, and you know our communication to thousands of people we're enriched by those experiences yeah and Definitely. we are we're learning different words from people you may say something to me you may say a word to me and i'll think oh i don't know what that means i'm going to go off and find out what that means and suddenly that's opened something else and something else so it's about keeping those channels open uh, and exposing certainly children to as many experiences as possible in a in a comfortable environment that they feel safe in doing so mm. Definitely. And do you think you should encourage them to work on their strengths more than their weaknesses? And the same thing goes for adults as well. Should, should we really try to improve our weaknesses or should we just focus on our strengths and bring other people in to support weaknesses? Great question, Ricky. Um, I don't like the word weakness and I'm sure Good. that okay. you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure yeah. that I'm not the first person to say that in, in the world. Um, I believe that it's a strength in the making. Um, and I think that weakness is a, is a relation of a, a negative word that, you know, is, is, is impacting. Mm. Um, and strengths is a good one. Um, strength management for me, uh, whether that's uh, emotional strength or physical strength, is, is really, really uh, a topic that's very close to my heart. So if we look at strengths, so if we say to, uh, if I say to you, right, okay, I want you to concentrate on your strengths. Actually, I'm giving you a limited platform. I'm limiting the way that because you've already you've already developed that part of you. So let's say it's a strength in I don't know. Um, if I say to you pu public speaking, okay. So you've you've spoken in a room with a hundred people, and I mm. say, well, concentrate on your strengths. You've done this before. That's that's almost a comfort zone because if you've done it before, that's great. Very interesting. That okay. Yeah. What do you need to do now? Okay. What do you have to do to get you to speak in a room of, of a thousand people? 2,000 mm. people, 3,000 people, 100,000 people. If I ask you to concentrate on your strength, your strength's limited to where you've been. So I'm giving you, I'm giving you a limiting platform. Mm. Well, I want to say to you, right, Ricky, what do you need to do? Okay, so mm. it's poshing that strength. Keep poshing that strength. So in terms of public speaking environment then, if I wasn't prepared for the topic I was going to talk about and I had an auto cue in front of me, then that would be a bit of a weakness. Mm which is probably something I should improve on. Is it a weakness though? Or is, um, it, is, it, is, just, it, is it triggering something that you need for you and your mind? Mm, I don't, well, I suppose it's reading speed. Yeah. yeah. But but then I suppose the the anxieties build up then as well, isn't it? Yeah. And then that and that triggers 
and in fact it's the week the, the reading speed again okay um but in terms of public speaking when it's just yeah. a free for all and, and can just talk about what I'm passionate about that's that's easy so yeah. it's very interesting to say that actually so well so that's not just and, focusing and, on strengths and that's a that's a really good that's a really good thing so there's two mm. things that you mentioned there okay anxiety mm. so anxiety and excitement are, are, are triggered in exactly the same way it's the same chemical flood Okay. But one, mm. we it's almost almost like a like, like like an XY switch. So if we if there's something that we don't know, so before we've done something, we have an anxiety. Yeah. So if I take you now on a zip wire and you've never been on one before, you're going to feel an anxiety because you don't know what to expect. Okay. There's two outcomes: you're going to love it or you're going to hate it. Mm. So if you love it, the next time I take you to the zip wire, you're going to feel excitement. Yeah. Yeah, if you hate definitely. it, you're going to feel more, you're going to feel heightened anxiety because I'm making you do something that you didn't like the first time. Now, that's not to say you can't do it. So how do we manage that? So strength management. So if I say to you then, Ricky, okay, now, first time around, we're going to go on the zip wire, okay, and you feel this pang of anxiety. That's quite natural because that's your ego and your fear keeping you protected. So it's going to suddenly, it's, it's triggered something. It's triggered your fight and flight uh, system. And now you've got this anxiety because you don't know what to expect. It's like going into battle. You don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. You're putting yourself on a wire and you're going to throw yourself down a, down a canyon. Okay. But, but so your fear is going, hold on, let's, let's be rational about this. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, so that, that's what's going to happen. So you go down, you come back and you've got this, you've got this, you know, this, this complete and utter uh, adrenaline burst. You've got this, this sensation that's going through you. It's just been absolutely mind blowing. It's beautiful you know you whip down you whip down this canyon you're going i don't know 100 miles an hour wow the wind's going through your hair if you had it and you know it's, it's great and it's exciting so i'll take you back up there and so in exactly you're doing you're going to do exactly mm. the same thing as you did before but now you're excited because you've got something to base it on so you're going back to that experience yeah okay so when you're in that you when you're in that environment in future if there's something that makes you anxious Okay, remember, anxiety and excitement are exactly the same. You can speak. It just so happens that you haven't spoke in front of this audience before. Mm. Then if we've got content that we're not talking about, of course, then you want to make sure you've got it right. Yeah. Well, then yeah. that's all about make, reading, reading, you know, put it that in your mind, in your mind, in your mind, and make that, you know, you get that into your mind and you get that into your subconscious and you know it's in there. Mm. That, that's repetition, repetition, repetition. So if it's content that you're not familiar with, unless I'm just putting you straight on the spot <laughs> and you've got to make it up, then of course, but you've got the opportunity to research that. That's true. Yeah. But you know how to speak, mm. whether it's in front of one person or 10,000 people, you've got that ability to talk. So when we break it down, okay, should I be excited or should I be anxious? Okay, anxious, what can go wrong? I might fluff it. Well, I'm a human being. Okay, and, and mm. when you start to tell yourself those things, you start to naturally calm yourself down. That's true. Then when, yeah. if, we then if we then couple that with breathing techniques where we're resetting our system to go from fight and flight to rest and digest, so the saber-toothed tiger is now no longer chasing us, but we're nice and calm, Suddenly, we can literally reformat our own chemical system, mm. walk out on stage, lights come on you, boom, you've done it, you've got it. <laughs> Do you know, one, so one easy, thing, isn't um, it? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Uh, one thing I always uh, think about sort of to myself, really, to overcome it, really, um, just to share it with others, is I think at the end of the day, everyone's exactly the same in that room, in the crowd, in the meeting, wherever. We all go home, take our shoes off, coat off, sit in front of the TV with our family or around the table and do exactly the same thing. And that and that's how I overcome the fear is the fact that everyone does exactly pretty much the same thing. We just spend time with our friends and family once we get home. We're humans. Yeah. We are humans. And if you yeah. if you dig down deeper, you know, while we're on the subject, you know, this this is multi layered. I would say people mm. like trees. Every year we get an, we get another layer to our tree and, you know, the the, the older we get the more the more layers we've got. Mm. Um, and in each of those layers is a residue that we carry through with us. Now, we've got positive residue and we've got negative residue. Okay? Okay. Each play a different part. Positive residues help us to grow. Negative residues hold us back. Okay. Now, if we, if we then take time and invest in ourselves, and this is about personal growth, and took time to literally unravel those layers, we want to put them back because they're, they're, they're us. But if we're unraveling a layer and we've got an opportunity to fix it, strengthen it 
make it better, remove the negative residue. Why wouldn't we do that? Because then we're making the future layers future proof mm. and we're, we're growing ourselves. So each one of those fears from somewhere has been created through those, through those years of our involvement. So it's all about, it's all about strengthening our confidence and looking at our belief systems, looking at the anxieties, what's created the anxiety, but it's authenticity. Mm. Everything is about authenticity. If you are authentically you and you are being authentic to your mind, your body and your soul and you're investing in all three, you will be at peace. There is no, there is no alternative to that. That, that is, that is the, the absolute outcome of living in, you know, living in Very peace true. Is, mm. is when everything is aligned because you've got nothing to prove to nobody. Mm. And so when we are fearful, we're fearful of being judged. We're fearful of being judged because we're wrong. We fear about being wrong because that's something that we're told when we're younger, you know, make sure you do it right, don't make mistakes, you know, those kind of things. So they're all little triggers inside of there. And actually, most people are too busy judging themselves to have time to judge other people, but we think that they're judging us. That's, that's, what that's a waste it there, of isn't energy. It, in a nutshell, really. What a waste of energy. <laughs> God, I love talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> What a complete and utter waste of energy. I think that is the same for everyone though, isn't it? It is just completely judging yourself. Yeah. And, and what people think of you, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. well, once you can overcome that yeah. and just realise it doesn't really matter too much at all, does it really? It do, do you know and what? And if you, mistake, if you make a mistake, I've just made one there. Perfect timing. <laughs> if you make a mistake on a stage, whether it's one person, you know, whether you, mm. just you and I, or whether it's 10,000 people, that's okay. Own it. Own mm. it. Do you know what? Take responsible f- responsibility for it. I'm making mm. loads now. These aren't on purpose. <laughs> Take responsibility for it. You yeah. know, communicate with that crowd and say to them, "I messed up. I yeah. messed up." Whether it's whether it's a figure, a statistic, whether it's something that you said, whether you tripped over, doesn't matter. And then just laugh about it. And laugh move about on. it. And do you know mm. what? It's about showing that vulnerability. Okay, because there isn't anybody. Yeah, I defy anyone. Bring me a perfect person, perfect mentally, perfect in the soul, perfect physically. There is no such thing as a perfect person, but we can be mm. work in motion. Mm. We can be work in, work in progress. Definitely. And that's about how much you invest in yourself and actually accept that this is me. I'm responsible for me. Nobody's responsible for my muck-ups in life. They're mine and I own them and that's fine. Well, earlier, what you said about people by people, the vulnerability and the transparency are what people buy into. Yeah. So by doing exactly that, that's how people buy into to your belief system yeah. and, and to, to everything that you stand for. You know. Yeah, I've got a um, I've got a framework that I work by, and mm. I always work with a plus minus equal. Always, it's really important mm. for me. Um, I, you know, it's taken me the best part of forty years to work out that actually, um, I like to service people. Um, I like to help people. Um. And I've, when, when I've been in environments where I've been uh, people talking about the motivation of money, I've, I've spoke the spoke, but something sounded wrong. And I couldn't work out what it was because I was living on somebody else's belief systems. I thought in order to be successful, you had to earn lots of money. Well, that's absolute rubbish. Mm. We've got, it, we've got it all wrong in the Western world. Completely, completely wrong. Um, and when you, when, you, when you look at those things and when you break those things down... Um, you know, I, I wasn't motivated by money. I was motivated and am motivated about helping other people. And I've mm. had to really work at that, um, and, you know, to get to 40 odd years of age to work out really that that's, that's, that's my motivation. That's what really excites me in life. And actually by doing what I'm loving doing and working all these things out and working out who the real me is, mm. I can service people a lot better hell of a lot better and my plus minus equals are is that in order for any community any any group of people any three individuals any any circle of 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 humans to grow we have to have that around us it's almost like a chemistry so at any one time i've always got a plus i've always got somebody that helps me that can mentor me that can be my coach because where am i growing to i want to grow i want to continually grow Equally, I'm somebody else's plus, and I hate to see. I, I don't like to say, you know, they're they're a minus because they're not a minus. It just means they're at a different stage in their mm. growth. Yep. But I'm somebody else's plus. You're my plus. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> and then at the same time, I've got mm. an equal. What does that equal do for me? That equal challenges me. Challenges me. 
really pushes me. It's like somebody snapping at my heels. And that's, 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 just, that's a chemistry that I work with. And I've always got that around me. See, that's great. That That's absolutely brilliant. So having those three different, well, multiple people within those categories, yeah, yeah. let's say, yeah. doing that is, um, is how, how you can grow as a person and self-develop in, in a way, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. 